You're listening to the Warlords of History podcast, an outstanding podcast covering the exploits of great warlords of the past. One thing I really appreciate about Mark's podcast is the focus on lesser-known warriors of history, such as Viriathus, Philip II, and Tamerlane. I'm William Hubbard, creator of the Layman's Historian podcast. Like Mark, the goal of my podcast is to highlight the stories of civilizations that are often forgotten nowadays. In my first season, I tell the story of the rise and fall of ancient Carthage. In this tale of drama and disaster, I take an in-depth look at this famous, or infamous, depending on who's writing the history, challenger to Rome in three epic wars. Also, it's the birthplace of Hannibal Barca, one of history's greatest warlords who nearly single-handedly arrested the destiny of the Romans with fire and sword. My hope is to cover other civilizations and their stories in future seasons, But if I piqued your interest regarding this once great yet now forgotten city, check out The Layman's Historian on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. After you finish with Mark's excellent episode, of course. Until we meet again, take care and read more history. In late October 1742, Nader the 54-year-old imposing Shah of the Iranian Empire stood in the cold open air of his fort in Dagestan, situated near the coastline of the Caspian Sea, at the foothills of the eastern North Caucasus Mountains. The base he had given the ominous name Iran Karab, meaning Ruin of Iran, a name that couldn't have been more fitting to describe the state of his ongoing war against the Lesgine tribes that wasn't going so well, and that would, in many ways, unbeknownst to all those present, was a sordid premonition of things to come through the balance of Nader's reign. Though certainly not what was occupying Nader's thoughts that day, as he stood within the walls of the fort, watching, with his face a cold mask, expressionless, looking down to the ground where Reza Koli, his eldest son, lay, breathing in excruciating pain, clutching his face, crying out in agony as the royal physicians rushed over to attend to his wounds, his eyes having been gouged out, left permanently blind. A punishment commanded by his father and king the penalty for having orchestrated a failed assassination attempt on Nader, who had convinced himself of his son's guilt, despite no clear line of evidence ever being presented, which the 50 witnesses of the horrific proceedings, those of the Persian nobility were well aware, but unwilling to voice their concerns for fear of the consequences in arguing against the will of their shah. The silence in the fort, however, soon broken, when Reza Koli, in between the waves of overwhelming pain, cried out to his father, It is not my eyes you have put out, but those of Persia. Words that triggered an acutely distressing expression to begin taking over Nader's features and his breath in the cold air coming out in short, rapid bursts as if the Shah had suddenly awoken from a nightmare, coming to the realization of what he had just done. Followed by another sudden change, with Nader's wild eyes hinting to the instability of his mindset, narrowing menacingly, as he slowly scanned the group of nobles before him, and his customary loud voice rising, reverberating throughout the confines of the fort, aimed at the nobility, blaming them, not he, for the travesty that had just occurred, spitting out with venomous rage that they had all committed a far greater crime in not offering themselves in place of his son, and that he would see to it that they would atone for their sins, promptly ordering his nearby royal guards to take possession of the beleaguered nobles, all of whom would be strangled in his presence, one by one. Welcome to the Warlords of History podcast. I'm your host, Mark Pimenta. Part 7, 
and the series finale diving into the lifetime and accomplishments of Nader Shah. This undeniably brilliant military tactician and battlefield commander, who emerged out of an insignificant poverty-stricken youth during a tumultuous period of upheaval and violence, to arise as the Shah of the Iranian Empire in the 18th century, reshaping his army and thus his nation into a militaristic juggernaut. And that by 1740 had moved far beyond his original mission of bringing Iran back from the brink of despair, protecting his nation from its many enemies and clawing back all of its lost territories to undertake an aggressive policy of expansion, foreign conquest, to expand its domains. Nader, time and time again, demonstrating an amazing sense of drive and perseverance, unwilling to let any obstacles stand in his way. Certainly admirable traits, but with there also being a frighteningly sharp double edge to this sword. Because underneath all of this, Nader's story is also one of a person possessing boundless personal ambition that would outstrip the ability of his nation and people to sustain his constant pursuit of war. And as we'll cover in this episode, resulting in a sad twist of fate, because in doing so, while it remains undeniable that he succeeded in protecting the Iranian Empire from being ripped apart at the onset of his career and early reign, his actions ultimately destroyed his nation from within leading to its economic ruin and a disaffected, disillusioned populace. Having sacrificed absolutely everything to enable him to continue waging war and grasping the Iranian crown, including the well-being and safety of his people, even their beliefs, sparking an unending sequence of internal revolts and rebellions that accelerated throughout the latter stages of his reign driving Nader to become more oppressive in his rule, made worse by his deteriorating mental health. Having reached the apex of his power and prestige in 1740, only to have everything rapidly spiral downwards into a horribly dark place, wherein his empire and accomplishments would, most literally, begin disintegrating in the moments following his death. However, before we get further into this final installment on Nader Shah, we have some shoutouts to take care of first, as I have the great pleasure of welcoming Raspberry, Jeffrey Sabo, and Sean Rehani as the newest members into the ranks of the Warlords of History Immortals. My deepest thanks goes to you and the existing Immortals for supporting the podcast through the Warlords of History Patreon page. Alright, now, as mentioned, this episode forms the seventh and concluding part of our series on Nader Shah. Meaning that, if you haven't been able to as of yet, you may first want to have a listen of parts 1 through 6 in the lead up to this episode, so that you have all the necessary background for understanding Nader's ambitions actions, and all the events we'll be learning about herein, including the legacy left behind as a result of Nader's violent reign. But in order to help with this, or bring you back up to speed as to where we left things off, here's a brief summary of what we encountered in the last episode. With Nader in 1736 having usurped the Iranian crown, and immediately using his newfound unchecked authority to begin imposing on his people what was in effect a new state religion, called Jafadi Islam, attempting to replace Twelver Shiism that dominated the landscape, including calling upon his recently defeated foes, the Ottomans, to raise the importance of the Jafadi denomination as a fifth pillar of Islam all of these changes being of fundamental importance to Nader in order to strengthen, beyond reproach, the legitimacy of his claim and that of his dynasty to kingship in Persia. 
while in the same breath breaking the Safavid dynasty's 200-year-old stranglehold on power. In doing so, however, causing a seismic rupture within his own empire, having upturned the long-entrenched belief systems of his people, while igniting a religious power struggle with the Persian Shia clergy, adding to the discontent that was already building due to the ongoing, tremendously heavy tax burdens that Nader was placing on his people to fund his inexhaustible appetite for the expansion of his army and near-constant pace of military campaigning with Nader seemingly indifferent to the economic ruin and famines that he was causing, while also being utterly ruthless and uncompromising when it came to the enforcement of his commands, not hesitating to brutally crush any internal unrest, before launching a campaign to claw back the last of Iran's lost domains, completing this in early 1738 with the storming and obliteration of the city of Kandahar, thereby fully serving retribution upon the Afghan Hotaks, who had, for a time in the 1720s, overtaken and controlled the lion's share of Iran, and clearing the path for Nader to start looking beyond his lands to embark on the next stage of his storied reign, foreign conquest. However, the timing of this phase also coinciding with the start of Nader's recurrent physical ailments that would also begin to impair his mental health, including sudden vicious flare-ups of rage and an increasing sense of paranoia, the latter largely directed at his eldest son, Reza Kohli. But at this early stage, only flaring up sporadically for shorter sequences of time, doing little to impede Nader in his campaign against the Mughal Empire. In the process, decisively winning two dazzling battlefield victories at the battles of Khyber Pass and Karnal, en route to the surrender of the Mughals in 1739 and the subsequent horrific sack of Delhi, only leaving after having extracted an immense dragon's hoard of wealth and peeling off all the Mughal lands west of the Indus River, which were officially ceded to Nader's Afsharid Iranian Empire, with the Iranian Shah then turning his attention to the northeast of his domains in Central Asia, readily smashing his way through the Khanats of Bukhara and Kiva in 1740 to absorb these states into his empire, thereby bringing Nader to the apex of his career and strength a king of kings reborn in the early modern age, but who, unsurprisingly, had no plans to take his foot off the accelerator. Bringing us to where we last left everything off in part 6, with the 53-year-old Nader Shah, fresh from his overwhelmingly successful Central Asian campaign, returning to his capital city, Mashhad, in January 1741 overseeing to the administration of his dominions, particularly the newly won territories, before departing two months later in March, initiating a 1,500-kilometer trek westwards across the width of northern Iran. Dagestan being his aiming point, the region situated in the North Caucasus, alongside the western coastline of the Caspian Sea at the southernmost tip of what is today Russia. The Iranian monarch leading a vast column of approximately 100,000 highly motivated and veteran troops to the intended destination, marching them through the province of Mazandaran that hugs the southern coastline of the Caspian. This force, accounting for just under half of his total army, estimated at around 230,000 by this point, having left the rest under the command of his second eldest son, Morteza Mirza Afshar, who Nader appointed to take charge of things at Khorasan, also acting as the caretaker of the eastern portion of his rapidly expanding empire, and whom Nader had since renamed Nazrola Mirza, meaning something akin to victory of or from God. 
granting him this honor in recognition of his bravery and actions displayed during the entirety of the Mughal campaign and the pivotal role that he had played commanding the Persian center at the Battle of Karnal. With the young man establishing himself as a talented general, certainly gaining his father's favor, standing in stark contrast to that of Reza Kohli, Nather's disgraced eldest son, who now accompanied his father in the westwards march, not because he too was a skilled military leader, which he was, and apparently an ambitious one at that, but more so because Nather wanted to keep a close eye on him, suspecting him of wanting to usurp his throne. A suspicion, thinking objectively, that was at least somewhat warranted, since, as you may recall from the last episode, Reza Koli had indeed made a play for the throne in 1739, when he had received erroneous reports that his father had died while on campaign. And although the distaste over Reza Koli's actions remained, particularly the manner in which he had disposed of the Safavids, aside from this father-son relationship remaining strained, it was of minor consequence in the grand scheme of things with Nader and his Afsharid Iranian empire at a notable high point of what must have felt like an unstoppable trajectory of momentum. A sentiment driven by the strength and echoed by the high morale of the Persian army marching at his back, galvanized by the following. 1. Although Nader had previously gone through a number of rough patches of poor health in recent years, physical ailments that had triggered some rather frightful character changes. The skillful medical care provided by Nader's chief physician, Alavi Khan, is said to have done wonders in terms of keeping the Shah's health relatively steady, resulting in few flare-ups of his physical symptoms and outbursts of unprovoked rage since taking him into his employ in 1739. In combination with the second factor, this being those under Nader's direct command having known nothing but victory since the Battle of Samara in 1733, eight years prior to that point in time. And even that loss being the only reversal among the scores of engagements he had masterfully led them through. Numerous victories that had not only saved his nation from being ripped apart in dislodging the Hotaks from their occupation of Iran but then later winning back the entirety of its domains from the Ottomans and Afghan Abdali and Gelzai tribes. More recently topped off by their staggering conquests at the expense of the Mughals and the Khanats of Bukhara and Kiva in Central Asia. The Iranian army being led in concert with Nader's undeniable tactical prowess did indeed appear to be making them into an unstoppable force of nature. And while yes, Nader demanded nothing less than the utmost discipline from his troops, this was something that they were well used to by now, understood to be a fundamental aspect of what had made them into the fearsome military machine that they had become, aided by the fact that Nader clearly cared for his soldiers, knowing that their fate and ongoing success remained intertwined with his which is why he always made sure that they were well paid and provisioned, fed and armed with the best equipment he could get his hands on. With the Iranian king now planning to unleash his gale force winds on the Lesgian people, that over the last five years had been causing considerable havoc in the northwestern corner of his empire. And as a quick side note here, is that previously, I referred to these people as Lesgians, which was an error, since that is a term that is associated with their spoken language. The appropriate term instead being Lesgin, which I'll be sure to use from here on in. In reference to this ethnic group native to the northeastern Caucasus region, whose ancestral homelands included parts of southern Dagestan and northern Azerbaijan. And that you may recall from earlier in the series, Nader had briefly campaigned against, biting hard at the Lesgins in 1735 before leaving the region in 1736 under the command of his brother Ibrahim. 
but with the Lesgines then renewing hostilities in 1739, imploring other nearby tribes for aid, which allowed them to build a sizable coalition that at its height would hover at nearly 50,000 warriors, primarily relying on traditional, muscle-powered weaponry, but having also adopted small arms gunpowder weapons to a limited degree, which enabled them to overrun the Iranian garrison stationed there, moving southwards, capturing portions of the Iranian lands in Azerbaijan, several cities, and killing Nader's brother Ibrahim in the process making for a tense and highly destabilized situation in the northwestern corner of his domains that Nather intended to fully address before it got further out of hand, while harshly repaying the Lesgines several times over for all the trouble they had caused. However, with the Iranian king being soon faced with a much closer and more immediate danger, one that threatened to end everything he achieved up until that point. Everything. His streak of successes, his reign, and his very life. Stemming not from his adversaries in Dagestan, but instead one coming from a lone assassin, standing at the edge of a small road in the heavily wooded region of central Mazandaran. The path that Nather was traveling along on May 15th, 1741 leading his long line of troops along this densely thick forest road that was awash in a springtime bloom, probably quite peaceful and beautiful to behold for any passers-by, but with this burst of foliage also hiding from view a would-be assassin, holding aloft a musket, waiting for the Iranian shah to appear in his crosshairs. With Nader soon coming into view, mounted and accompanied only by a handful of advisors and guards, at a considerable distance from any of the units in front or behind of him, resulting in the assassin emerging out from the forest flanking the road, some twenty paces away from Nather, to fire in the Shah's direction. And while the bullet did indeed hit the intended target, luckily for Nather it only grazed his hand embedding itself into the neck of his mount instead, resulting in the horse falling to the ground and taking the shah down with it, neither having the presence of mind to lay still as if killed to avoid a second shot, with the assassin then fleeing into the woods. Minutes afterwards, Nather's son, Reza Koli, and a collection of the rearguard troops rushing forward to arrive on the scene who then dispersed into the forest to track down the gunmen, but came up empty-handed. And although a wider search for the assassin was initiated at that time, there was a notable collective sigh of relief that the Shah was able to escape this event relatively unscathed. Well, kind of. Because if anyone had the powers of foresight and understood what was going to happen from here on in, Perhaps those alongside the Shah wouldn't have been so eager to chase the assassin away, since this is the point from which a veritable nosedive would commence, taking a turn for the worse. Much, much worse. Interestingly, however, in the immediate aftermath of that close call for Nather, he remained surprisingly calm and collected, commanding a full investigation of the event to identify how this had been allowed to happen, and any that may have been involved in the plot, before resuming the westwards march, stopping off at the city of Tehran to collect some troops and reorganize themselves for the final stretch of the march into Dagestan. Where a Russian diplomat had also arrived, by the name of Kalushkin, seeking an audience with the Iranian Shah in order to get a better sense of Nader's intentions in his upcoming campaign against the Lesgines, that would inevitably bring the Persian forces uncomfortably close to the Russian Empire's southern borderlands. A meeting that was reportedly less than cordial, with Nader acting and speaking with, let's just say, something of a belligerent grandiosity that put the emissary on edge. 
and that would later report back to the court of Anna Ivanovna in Moscow that Nader had been much more difficult to reason with than previously, and that while Nader remained staunchly hostile to the Ottomans, he was now feeling less confident that Iran would remain friendly to Russia. Best evidenced by the words of Kalushkin himself, when he reported that the new Nebuchadnezzar had been rendered quite mad by his triumphs, then including a direct quote from Nader, who had boasted, It was not difficult for me to conquer all India. If I move with only one leg, I take India. If I move with both legs, I shall conquer the whole world. Clearly, something had switched with Nader, given that, in earlier instances of diplomacy with Russia, his supposed ally, he had shown a great deal of restraint and rather wise political posturing, not to mention a shrewd ability to negotiate agreements beneficial to both parties. But this silky touch no longer seemed to be within the Shah's personal arsenal of skills, and there was evidently more hints and events leading to Nather's mental unraveling, akin to the visual of a snowball at the top of a hill slowly beginning to careen down and build in size and momentum. First, with the Shah, despite the investigation of his attempted assassination still underway and no clear line of evidence presented, increasingly suspecting his son, Reza Kohli, of being the mastermind behind the attempt, leading to Nader leaving him behind at Tehran under close supervision before resuming the march to Dagestan, approximately 700 kilometers to the north. And secondly, this point in time also being notable for his exceptionally skilled chief physician, Alavi Khan, leaving Nader's service. Nader having granted Alavi Khan's request to allow him to make a pilgrimage to Mecca. Who, as a quick side note, as if anticipating future events, Alavi Khan later, upon completing his pilgrimage, and wisely, I would add in, didn't return to Nader's court, opting to return to Delhi instead. And while Nader's character was once again beginning to revert to uncharted territory, upon reaching what is today southeastern Azerbaijan in early July 1741, with a formidable army of approximately 150,000 soldiers, At least, for a short time, the familiar demands of planning for their assault brought him to focus on the task at hand. However, not being able to anticipate that, unlike the steady-moving and relatively straightforward campaigns of conquest waged against the Mughals and the Khanats of Central Asia, that this endeavor, especially for his troops, was going to be an altogether different and brutally harsh experience. Granted, a notion hard to foresee at the onset, given that the opening months of the campaign went exceedingly well, as the Iranian army, from July through to October 1741, easily swept through Azerbaijan pushing north, fighting a series of skirmishes against the Lesguins, who were unable to hold back the Persian advance allowing Nader to pretty much recapture the entirety of Azerbaijan and a thin strip of land in between the North Caucasus mountain range and the coast of the Caspian, into what is today southern Dagestan. Doing so without breaking a sweat, pushing the Lesguins all the way back to their strongholds within the eastern mountains of the North Caucasus range, and effectively surrounding them there as well. Though an important note is that the Lesguin coalition was still quite large, estimated at somewhere in between 40 to 50,000. And while their initial engagements against the Persians did result in some casualties for them, they were minimal, as it appears that the keystone to their overall strategy was avoiding any large pitched battles. And whenever faced with large bodies of Iranian troops, simply melting away retreating to the mountains, most likely with the intention to do as they did in earlier instances, later returning to recapture the lands that they associated with the wider Lesguin homeland, 
once the main Iranian army moved on elsewhere. And consequently, this being the point that Nader's campaign started going horribly awry. Because, despite winter starting to take hold of the region, the Iranian Shah made the fateful decision to keep the pressure on and his massive army in field. Setting up forts at the foothills south and east of the mountains, from which incursions could be made into the heartland of Lesgian resistance. But this being a definitive error in judgment, because in opting for this, instead of moving the bulk of his army back into Iran for the winter until springtime, when the weather would be more conducive to military operations in the region, his wrathful desire to fully quash the Lesgians drove what was effectively an emotional decision at the cost of sound military strategy. Since, keeping this massive force of 150,000 in field over the course of the winter and the associated heavy resource demands, made supplying these many forts holding large numbers of troops a logistical nightmare, forcing Nader to make use of Russian merchants operating in the Caspian Sea, but only gaining provisions at an exorbitant cost which evolved into increasingly contentious relations with Russia that wilted further upon the Russian royal court's denial of Nather's request to loan him any of their Caspian naval fleet to help with his supply issues. A problem that was growing into a massive headache for Nather, with large proportions of the expensive provisions that were trickling in being lost to raids. Due to the Lesgines having home field advantage, with no one knowing these lands like they did, the geography, mountainous with craggy passes and also blanketed by forests, perfect for guerrilla warfare and concealing their movements, which they expertly used to descend down from their strongholds, conducting lightning raids against the Persian forces, heavily disrupting their supply lines throughout the winter of 1741 resulting in severe food shortages, and then later on into the savagely cold and snowy winter, disease, plague starting to set in, eating its way through the Iranian troops. And finally, adding to the misery, was one instance where another's personal tent was ransacked. And although he was away at this time, this became another mental tipping point for Nader infuriating him to such a degree that he began maliciously lashing out and executing his own officers and soldiers for errors made and their inability to stave off the dizzying Lesgine raids. Unsympathetic to the fact that it was he who had put them into this hugely disadvantageous position in the first place. In this campaign that mutated into a messy slog, that remained the status quo throughout the balance of the winter in 1741 into the spring of 1742, with the Iranian losses mounting, historical accounts providing no details to the casualty rate other than quantifying it with the word heavy, though possibly as high as in the tens of thousands. Followed by Nader demanding more recruits to be gathered from across the northwestern quadrant of his empire and pressed into service, in preparation for a renewed push into the Lesgian heartland in May 1742. However, with the weakened status of his troops and the geography of the battlegrounds making for a painstakingly slow and crawling invasion, locked in a vicious and grinding cycle of small bloody raids and counter raids, yielding some Persian successes pushing the Lesgines to their back heels, yes, but that only made supplying their forward encampments that much more difficult amidst the near constant harassment of Lesgine raids. And the tide starting to turn. In the late summer of 1742, with a number of significant blows dealt upon the Persians. In August, with the Lesgines ambushing and defeating a 6,000 strong force of Iranian troops, that once again threw Nader into a ferocious rage, executing a number of the officers involved. And then in September, with Nader himself leading an assault inwards, 
but that too became subject to constant harassment, eventually forcing him to call for a retreat. This instance being additionally notable in that, despite personally commanding this thrust, Nather continually blamed those under him for their lack of success, unwilling to accept any responsibility for the result. And all the while, the lack of food, clean drinking water, and growing sickness continuing to devastate his army that he still categorically refused to remove from the field, commanding them to remain there, desperately trying to tighten the noose around the Lesgine resistance. Bringing us to that somber event that we covered at the top end of this episode, and Nather's precarious state of mind, when, in October 1742, upon learning that his would-be assassin had been captured, Nather departed from the front lines to the main Iranian fort he had commanded built in the region, the main supply depot near the Caspian coast, situated just outside the modern-day city of Derbent in southern Russia, the fort where both the assassin and his eldest son Reza Koli had been brought to, and that Nader had earlier given the unusual name Iran Karab, in Persian meaning ruin of Iran. And while his motivation for calling it this dismal name is unknown, perhaps relating to this portion of his empire that was in a frightfully chaotic state, certainly this was a label that couldn't have been more ironic given what had and would unfold during the course of the Dagestan campaign. Nader, upon reaching the fort, immediately having the assassin dragged to him for questioning, who continually asserted that he alone was responsible for the attempt, no one having commanded him to do so. And while it's been argued that he had no reason to distort the truth, since his doomed fate was already sealed, neither remained unwilling to believe this. And despite many prospective culprits being named and argued among Nather's closest advisors, since he obviously had no shortage of enemies within and around his empire, even though no clear line of evidence pointed to any one figure, Nather's wrath settled on his son. This distasteful event brought to its climax when Reza Koli was brought before Nather, and though his son continued to protest his innocence, Nather ordered the prince's eyes gouged, leaving him permanently blind. This grisly act, right away, followed by another atrocity, also demonstrating for us the confusing turmoil that was Nather's mind, since he reportedly fell into a deep anguish after he had commanded the blinding of Reza Koli, anguish that gave over to a storm of rage, directed upon the fifty or so Persian nobility that had just witnessed the proceedings. The Iranian Shah delivering a verbal lashing at the nobles, stating that they were the ones responsible for what had just occurred, committing a grave crime in not offering themselves up in place of his son to receive the punishment, before ordering all of them strangled in his presence. Somehow, the sequence of events, and again, despite no new information being brought to light, then leading him to now staunchly believe that Reza Koli was innocent of the charges he had been brought up on, and Nader becoming so overcome by grief by the whole ordeal that he fell into a deep depression, retiring to his tent in a self-imposed isolation for three days. In the month following, Nader returning to the front against the Lesgines through the winter of 1742 into 1743. However, with the stalemate continuing, Famine, sickness wreaking havoc on his troops, while locked in bitter, bloody fighting with his adversaries, yielding no results. But with the situation in that theater rapidly evolving, in large part due to the rising tensions between Iran and Russia, heightening to such a degree that the Russians began amassing troops at their nearby southern border in case Nader decided to attack and who was apparently seriously contemplating launching an operation there. An inclination that got tossed out as a possibility, 
with the arrival of a Turkish embassy at Nader's camp in February 1743, bearing a response from Sultan Mahmud, wherein it was made resoundingly clear of the Ottomans' definitive refusal to comply with Nader's demands of making Jafari Islam into the fifth pillar of Islam. This giving us some additional insights here, because, you see, although absolute in his rule and tightly grasping the reins of power in Persia, Nader must still have not felt fully secure in his position as Shah. And although, as we well know by now that his mindset was unraveling, one of the entrenched goals that he never lost sight of, and that evidently still hung over his head, was legitimizing his right to the crown beyond the point of a sword, wanting to solidify this right through religious or divine means. In fact, so immense of a driving force that this remained, that upon receiving this news, Nader, absolutely infuriated by the outcome, right away renounced his idea of invading Russia, pressed the pause button on the current war against the Lesgines, and promptly declared war on the Ottoman Empire. Immediately sending communications to his son, Nazarullah, based across the width of the empire in Mashhad, commanding him to collect 80,000 troops and urgently make their way to western Iran, with Nader leaving a large contingent of troops behind at Dagestan, perhaps as many as 30,000, under the command of one of his generals to maintain their footing against the Lesgines. And in mid-February 1743, just a week or so after his exchange with the Ottoman envoy, moving at a phenomenal rate of speed to begin personally leading the rest of his force, around 120,000, in a 1200 km southwards march towards the city of Sanandaj, located close to the modern Iran-Iraq border, the location that was to be his staging point for the upcoming Ottoman invasion. But we'll get to this in a little more detail shortly. Because I think this is a good point in the storyline to take a step back and get an overview as to what was happening holistically within the Afsharid Iranian Empire to understand all the applicable future implications. First and foremost, what the size and scale of Nader's military forces was looking like. On the eve of Nader's Second Ottoman War, although the total number is disputed among historians, it being generally accepted that the Iranian army had topped out at an enormous 375,000 troops at this time. A mind-boggling figure, since not that long ago, 14 years prior in 1729, upon retaking Iran from the Hotax, Nader's army had only counted 25,000. But since that time, due to Nader's constant prodding, a count that had expanded exponentially, stationed and involved in theaters all around the empire, Roughly 200,000 that would be accumulated under Nader himself, including the forces that Nazarola had brought from the east. The aforementioned 30,000 strong army that Nader had left behind at Dagestan. The large grouping maintained at Mashhad, primarily tasked with keeping the east defended, with another important hotspot being the Persian Gulf, particularly the ongoing campaign that Nader had commanded Muhammad Taki Khan to undertake in conquering Oman, that we had touched upon in the last episode. Clearly, Nader had indeed constructed a large and formidable army. However, what this also accumulated to was an unsustainably expensive military, far outstripping the economic capabilities of his empire. And while in the aftermath of Nader's 1739 invasion against the Mughals, although he had extracted untold amounts of wealth from that endeavor, enough to suspend the taxation of his subjects for three years, the constant push to expand his army to that astounding figure of 375,000, while replacing casualties, keeping up with the costly provisional needs of campaigning, equipping his men with the best arms and armaments available, all in the effort to maintain his ceaseless cadence of warring, 
This resulted in Nather absolutely burning through the immense wealth he had earlier accumulated, threatening to once again plummet his nation into bankruptcy, and sadly, revert to the practice of heavily taxing his subjects across the entirety of his domains, while sending contingents of his troops wherever he passed through to despoil his own people in order to supply and feed his army, akin to locust swarms, stripping their crops and grain stores bare, leaving them in a wretched state of famine, while of course also eating up the available manpower as well, pressing them into military service to replace his army's losses. So given this, why didn't Nader do anything to address the situation? Attempting to revive the Iranian economy, which in turn, would have allowed him to avoid such destructive behavior yet still enable him to fund his military? Well, the short answer for this was that social and economic matters were not Nather's strong suit, since, as we well know by now, he was a warrior through and through, possessing a single-minded focus in using military force to achieve all his wants, those relating to both his empire and personally as well. Furthermore, you see, the terrible economic reality that Nader was regularly wrestling with was endemic of a much wider problem, long plaguing his nation, with Iran being a significantly lesser economic power compared to its richer neighbors, in particular the Ottomans and Mughals, evident by the massive GDP gap comparison that we touched upon in the first episode of the series an ever-present gap arising out of two main factors. One, the relatively small Iranian population, residing within a large geographical landmass, laden with deserts and mountain ranges. The inhabitants, physically separated over long distances and consisting of different ethnic groups, also including nomadic and semi-nomadic tribal entities meaning that, for the most part, the people of the Iranian Empire did not form a unified entity, a situation beneficial for its kings to maintain centralized control, but not conducive to a robust economy. Made worse by the second factor, again, for the most part, this empire also being one, rarely led by monarchs, possessing an overarching economic vision unable to direct the populace to work in unison, nor establish a lot in the way of lucrative domestic industries, other than a relatively modest involvement in raw silk production and exportation. Although, that is not to say that there wasn't some potential, because from roughly the mid-1500s into the mid-1600s, the Iranian economy had been showing a great deal of promising growth, due to it being a vital trade link along what had been known as the Silk Road, in between various economic giants. Emphasized by Rudy Mathi's chapter in the book, Iran and the World in the Safavid Age, when he wrote that, with the establishment of the Safavids, Iran seems to have witnessed a remarkable expansion of economic activity, precisely because of its location at the crossroads of several commercial routes. Iran exported a substantial amount of raw silk to the West, but even more important was the role the country played in overland and maritime trade of consumer goods such as spices, sugar, and textiles moving westwards. Of similar importance was the flow of precious metals going in the opposite direction. Accordingly, setting the stage for some seriously favorable economic conditions, but that unfortunately, rapidly decayed from the mid-1600s onwards, linked to the associated decay of the late Safavid dynasty rulers, who retreated from actually running their empires for the pleasures of the harem, spurring increased corruption that weakened trade operations, and that was later devastated by the internal strife and wars that took hold of the landscape into the early 18th century, before Nader rose to prominence. The deeply unstable situation within Persia, 
increasingly resulting in alternative global trade routes being established. And speaking of which, when Nader smashed his way onto the scene, although it is without question that he salvaged Iran from being torn apart, beyond this having the opportunity to calm the internal instability within which trade could have once again been encouraged to flourish. His noted penchant for ravaging his very own people to sustain his militant objectives with no one like merchants being spared from this fate, these actions, along with the internal instability and rebellions that he provoked, further accelerated the commercial ruin of his empire, while of course sacrificing the well-being of the populace. Oh yes, definitely a recipe for disaster. Now, while we can only guess that Nader viewed the continual pursuit of conquests as a lucrative source of funds, like experienced in the aftermath of the Mughal campaign and the sack of Delhi, the financial windfall out of that occurrence had been most certainly an anomaly, because the campaigns that he undertook beyond that point had yielded little in the way of being profitable enterprises. Since Central Asia had been taken, yes, but like Iran, was also economically depressed. And as for the campaign he had ordered Mohammad Taki Khan to pursue in the Persian Gulf and Oman, by 1743, Taki Khan did manage to eventually level its capital of Muscat as ordered. But in truth, Iranian control there remained tenuous at best. And according to Lawrence Lockhart in his book Nader Shah, this endeavor being more accurately described as a costly failure, since at least 20,000, but probably more Persian troops, had perished either in battle or from the ravages of disease, this heavy sacrifice bringing no commensurate advantage, the Oman operations imposing a prolonged and useless drain upon Nader's resources, and the efforts to provide men and material to carry them on causing much deprivation and suffering in southern Iran. A sentiment equally applicable to Nader's recent campaign against the Lesguins in Dagestan, that aside from some meager gains in capturing a few of their isolated fortresses, but unable to defeat them wholly, this came at a tremendously heavy cost to Persia in terms of manpower and material resources. A cost that was about to worsen as we now return to the chronological sequence of events. In February 1743, with Nader leading some 120,000 soldiers southwards to the city of Sanandaj, in the lead-up to his second war against the Ottomans. In particular, at the early stages of this march, showing a notable disregard for the welfare of his troops. And despite their weakened and sorry state, with a severe lack of provisions, setting an aggressive pace in the midst of terrible winter conditions that would make for a horrifying march, claiming the lives of many of his soldiers. Described to us in vivid, blood-curdling detail by Lawrence Lockhart. In blizzards and extreme cold, the Iranian host dragged its way southwards. The troops suffered terribly from hunger as well as the cold and were even reduced to the extremity of eating pies made of human flesh. So many men and animals died on the road during the initial stages of the journey that it was strewn with bodies and carcasses. Now, exactly how many of his soldiers died in this march is unknown. However, whatever the toll was, despite being heavy, well into the thousands, it seemed to matter little to the Iranian monarch. When later, joined by his son Nasrullah and the troops from the east, as well as replacement soldiers pressed into service, upon arriving at Sanandaj in July 1743, this had enabled Nader to amass an invasion force approximately 200,000 strong. Arriving there at a much quicker pace than the Ottomans were expecting, and that apparently caught them flat-footed straining to raise a field army strong enough to combat what Nader had brought to their doorstep, who only spent a brief couple of days at Sanandaj before initiating the campaign and crossing over the border into the Ottoman domains. On August 5th, 
appearing at the city of Kirkuk, just under 350 kilometers west of his starting point. But due to the city being only lightly defended, falling to the Iranians in just over a week, with Nader then progressing onwards, 100 kilometers north to the city of Erbil, doing the same, taking it after a brief assault in early September. Nader's intentions becoming clear to the Ottomans, that he was aiming for the city of Mosul, 80 kilometers west of Erbil, which Nader commenced a siege of on September 14th. However, with this undertaking being quite different from the earlier two city captures, since by that point, anticipating where the Iranians were headed, the Ottomans, while still not yet ready with a strong enough field army, what they had been able to do was organize a large defending force of 30,000 Turkish soldiers that beat Nader in the race to Mosul, who just a few days later arrived there with his 200,000 troops in tow, encircling the city, bringing along 160 cannons and 230 mortars that were pulled forth to pour a fury of artillery fire upon the city, both day and night with the defenders working tirelessly to repair any breaches to their walls. The Iranians also attacking from underground, attempting to mine their way to below the city walls, but with the Ottomans among their defensive contingent also containing some rather clever engineers that managed to expertly counter these attempts with mining efforts of their own. The momentum and energy behind the siege of Mosul thus slowing to a crawl, but with Nader impatient to finish things off quickly, because he knew that it was just a matter of time before the Ottomans would be ready with a large army of their own. And in taking Mosul, Nader seemingly wanted to use this, along with the cities he had already conquered as leverage, bargaining chips to get the Ottomans to change their mind regarding Jafari Islam. His impatience in this endeavor, evident by his actions, Unlike the sieges he had orchestrated in the past, more careful in his use of human assaults, being rather frivolous with the lives of his troops in an effort to conquer the city quickly, ordering no less than 12 waves of large assaults that were all beaten back at a tremendous loss to the attackers. Followed in late October, after a 40-day siege with Mosul still standing, Nader suddenly commanding his army to pack up and leave, retreating back to Sanandaj. Why would he do that? Not because anything had changed in this theater as of yet. No substantial Turkish armies appearing on the horizon. Nor because he didn't think the city couldn't be conquered. But primarily because disturbing news began emerging from within his own domains that a firestorm of rebellions had erupted in provinces all across his empire, various governors, tribes, and others of the populace tipped over the edge into active resistance against their shah in response to the excessively heavy taxation that Nader had levied to fund the Ottoman campaign. Also in response to the high rate of casualties that his wars had caused, particularly over the past three years, resulting in near-constant streams of young men being scoured from his domains, pulled from their families and pressed into Nader's ranks to replace those slain. And of note is that Nader was now having a great deal of difficulty finding enough recruits to replace his losses. All of this adding to the pre-existing discontent that had already been simmering as a result of Nader's earlier rounds of heavy taxation and the religious upheaval he had incited with his push to make Jafari Islam the new state religion. The aforementioned change, as covered in the last episode, that had sparked a power struggle with the Shia mullahs challenging the Twelver belief system that had for two centuries become so deeply woven into society. In late 1743, all of these things, among other sources of resentment, coalescing to drive the populace into open defiance in areas and provinces all over his empire, including the following. In Azerbaijan, with the Lezgins, now that the bulk of the Iranian army had departed, 
more boldly venturing down from their mountain strongholds to once again begin striking at the areas recently reclaimed by Nader. With problems in the Iranian Caucasus region spilling over into what is today the country of Georgia, where an exiled prince began fighting to dislodge those Nader had installed as his vassals. To contain both of these, Nader sending his son, Nazrola, with a large detachment to take charge of the northwest, which he handled remarkably well. However, at the same time, many other rebellions starting to gain steam. Across in the northeastern portion of his empire, in the recently conquered Central Asian Khanats that began fighting to free themselves from the Iranian yoke. And in nearby Astarabad, what is today the Golestan province of Iran, just to the southeast of the Caspian Sea. To combat these uprisings, Nader sending his nephew, Ali Koli Khan, who would eventually manage to stamp out the uprising in Astarabad, though the Khanats would remain a perpetual problem. And adding to this heap of burning revolts was essentially the entire southern portion of Iran up in arms. In the central southeast province of Kerman, the neighboring province of Sistan deeper to the southeast, with arguably the most dangerous situation of the bunch being a rebellion triggered by none other than Mohammed Taki Khan that rallied much of the southwest to his banner, including the provinces of Fars, Hormozagan, and Boucher. This being the same Taki Khan that had captured Oman less than a year prior, but due to the wider distaste regarding Nader's popularity, plus a spat that developed between the two, since Nader wasn't pleased with the tenuous hold on Oman and believed him to be corrupt, Taki Khan chose this moment to attempt carving out a kingdom of his own. This, the most serious of the rebellions facing Nader's tenure as Shah, was the one he would attend to himself. Making 1744 an exceedingly dark stain on Nader's reign, since he was essentially in active war against his own subjects, having commanded his son and nephew to use all force necessary to put down the revolts they had been tasked with addressing. But with Nader's campaign to deal with Taki Khan's rebellion in the southwest, noted for its excessive brutality. And whereas Taki Khan managed to gather a rebel force around him of approximately 10 to 15,000, Nader moved southwards with over 50,000 troops, leading them from Sanandaj, covering a distance of 1,200 kilometers to eventually arrive in March 1744, just outside the city of Shiraz, where Taki Khan had set up his headquarters. Using extreme force to quash any forms of resistance that stood in his way, all the way to the doomed city, which then became subject to a cruel, four and a half month long siege, with the Iranian Shah uncaring as to the horrors he was inflicting among the innocents caught in the crossfire. And despite all the trials and tribulations it had endured in recent years, Nader's army still undeniably effective, with Taki Khan's forces unable to counter the siege, later surrendering Shiraz to Nader in June, that Nader then sacked as if it were an enemy city. Best conveyed to us by Nader's chief biographer, Mirza Mehdi Khan, who was an eyewitness of these events, writing that Shiraz suffered terribly as a result of the siege. All the lovely gardens around were destroyed. When the royal troops entered the city, they pillaged every house and put to death many persons. Two towers containing human heads were erected. After the siege, plague broke out and carried off no less than 14,000 people. And upon capturing Taki Khan, Nader conceiving a cruel punishment that even the description of is certainly not for the faint of heart. With, Taki Khan made a eunuch and one of his eyes put out, leaving the rebel leader with the use of his other eye so he could witness the culminating point of his humiliation and disgrace including his wife given over to the soldiery, followed by three of the Khan's sons and his brother put to death in front of him. 
Though shortly afterwards, in yet another bewildering reversal, giving us more evidence to the confused turmoil that was Nader's mindset, the Shah, lamenting the cruel punishments he had inflicted on Taki Khan, thinking that he may have been a tad harsh with him. And so, not only did he not execute him, but, unbelievably, restored Taki Khan to favor and later installed him as the governor of Kabul. Sadly, however, what didn't change was Nather's ravaging of his people to finance his insatiable appetite for military campaigning. As he commanded his troops, through the balance of 1744, to go throughout southwestern Iran, regardless of whether they had been involved in Taki Khan's rebellion or not, to scrape funds and provisions from the already depleted populace. Since Nader remained fully intent on resuming his war against the Ottomans. Returning to the Caucasus in the spring of 1745, to first launch a brief siege upon the Ottoman city of Kars in modern eastern Turkey, but months in, required to abandon this unsuccessful attempt, with Dagestan once again flaring up into hostilities. Nader subsequently joining forces with his son Nazrola to stabilize the region, which only succeeded in driving the Lesgines to retreat back to their mountain strongholds. And although Nader had been toying with methods through which he could destroy the Lesgines fully, he was interrupted in this venture when reports began reaching him that the situation along Iran's western border shared with the Ottomans that things there had taken a definitive turn, being that Sultan Mahmud had fielded not one, but two large Turkish armies in an effort to take the offensive against Nader. One of 130,000 headed to Nader's domains in what is present-day Armenia, and the other, although we don't have any specifics on the exact size, approaching further south via Mosul, aiming to enter western Iran, taking the path that Nader had used for his invasion two years back in 1743, forcing Nader to split his army into two, sending one large detachment under the command of Nazarola to face the Ottoman group to the south, and Nader leading a force of 80,000 to take on the Turkish army marching towards the city of Yerevan in Armenia. Nader managing to reach there first. However, during the march from Dagestan, experiencing a flare-up of his physical health problems, so severe that for a number of days he had to be carried in a litter while en route to the city. Whereupon, shortly after reaching Yerevan, Nader recovered enough from his illness to mount up, and lead his 80,000 strong army 20 kilometers north to Yegevard. The site where 10 years prior, that you might remember from part 5 of the series, Nader, with only 15,000 troops, outnumbered more than 5 to 1, had won an incredible victory over the Ottomans in 1735 to put an end to their earlier war, and to where this Ottoman army of 130,000 was again approaching in 1745. And whereas this encounter would go down in history as the Battle of Kars, the initial days of the fight would in fact start on the exact same plateau that Nader, like then, had selected for his encampment, and from where the last spark of Nader's fading military brilliance would be displayed, as if invoking the spirit of the battlefield commander he had previously been. In the morning of August 9, 1745, the Ottoman force coming into Nader's view, composed of 40,000 infantry, including Janissaries, in the center, artillery interspersed in between their lines, and nearly 90,000 cavalry split evenly into two wings on the flanks. But with the Ottoman general, wisely, not daring to venture close enough to the Iranian high ground, so as to get peppered by Nader's artillery, resulting in Nader taking the initiative in the mid-morning, sending his 25,000 musketmen forth to engage the Ottoman infantry, accompanied by around 15,000 Persian cavalry protecting the sides of his infantry. Interestingly though, 
holding back an enormous group of 40,000 cavalry that he kept in reserve. Nather's musketmen, spearheaded by the Jazayirchi, briefly stopping in front of the opposing infantry, using their superior range to fire one single massed volley before drawing their shamshirs and charging into the Ottoman center, which, several hours in, evolved into a gruesome sight. And while this was where the bulk of the Persian casualties would be incurred, the Ottoman losses were just as severe, the battle raging on with no clear side gaining the advantage. The Ottoman general content to let the infantry battle play out, confident that his superior numbers would allow them to overcome their Iranian counterparts, and apparently hesitant to throw the Turkish cavalry into the mix, because he knew that Nader had a large cavalry reserve somewhere in the vicinity, that he had been waiting for the right moment to unleash, and although the 57-year-old Iranian king was still suffering from the lingering remnants of his latest illness flare-up. In viewing the precarious status of the field, although he now typically, due to his advanced age, had for some time not immersed himself into these melees personally, preferring to command from the back, given the gravity of the situation at hand, this was the point he decided to take action himself. Donning his armor, holding aloft his famous war axe, and calling for his entire force of 40,000 cavalry to ready themselves, driving them into a motivated frenzy that, in the afternoon, departed from the Iranian encampment, Nather leading them, utilizing a brilliant approach, a quick-moving but wide-looping maneuver to avoid detection and suddenly appear on the Ottoman right, charging forward in one menacing wave. Across the length of the battlefield, to smash into the awaiting Turkish cavalry. After a brief but ferocious fight, throwing the Ottoman horsemen into utter chaos, dispersing them from the field. A devastating hammer blow, rendered with such incredible speed and precision, that the Ottoman commander was caught flat-footed, unable to counter and adjust for this in a timely manner. And that, having driven the rightmost group of Turkish cavalry from the field, soon threatened to surround his center, resulting in the Ottoman general calling for his infantry to fall back. But as a result of the success of Nader's decisive cavalry charge, this also reinvigorated his infantry to push forward, exerting relentless pressure on the Ottoman center and slaying thousands in the process, causing the Ottoman infantry to crumple and fall into a disorganized retreat, abandoning the field with the rest of the Ottoman army following suit, retreating back to their heavily fortified camp several kilometers away. That Nader promptly surrounded, bringing forward the Iranian artillery to begin bombarding his remaining adversaries that were hunkered down there, reportedly causing so much distress amongst his foes that the Ottoman general either committed suicide or was killed due to a mutiny from within their ranks all the while having a hail of projectiles thrown upon them by Nather's forces. This becoming the status of the battle for the next couple of days. But since, for the Ottomans, it was becoming clear that no one was coming to save them and that their encampment would soon be their tomb, several nights into the encirclement, they made a desperate, united push to break out, which succeeded, but that Nather had prepared for. The chaotic flight from the camp resulting in the Ottomans breaking up into smaller bodies of troops, desperately trying to make their way to safety, that Nather's cavalry relentlessly pursued and butchered almost all the way back to the city of Kars, thus marking the end of the Battle of Kars on August 19th, 10 days after its start. And while the Persian casualties ended up mounting to 8,000, most of this incurred in the first day. The Ottoman army's count would reach nearly 40,000 troops lost, with the rest scattered. On this final day of battle, Nader also receiving a message from his son Nazarullah, bearing more great news, that he too had met and crushed the Ottoman army to the south near the city of Mosul, 
furthermore requesting permission from his father to advance. However, to the surprise of all, this being a request that neither denied, ordering his son to stand down, while neither himself chose to collect his troops and move them back to Yerevan, instead of putting cars to siege as would have been expected. Probably bringing to mind the question for you, why would he ease off now, having erased two Ottoman armies from the field, holding an overwhelming edge over his Turkish foes? In truth, we don't know for sure, but the most agreed-upon notion is that the Iranian Shah had a strategic moment of clarity, understanding that, while currently holding a distinct advantage, he didn't have the resources to invade the Ottoman domains with any hopes of long-term success. And the reality of the situation was that he was having tremendous difficulty finding adequate manpower to reinforce his army and replace its losses. Furthermore, understanding that regardless of the setbacks they had experienced, the Ottomans still had much deeper pockets in terms of riches and military resources that would allow them to continue the fight. Accordingly, the Iranian Shah instead used this moment to put an end to the hostilities and open peace talks with Sultan Mahmud, who eagerly leapt at this opportunity, entering into negotiations to finalize the terms of the peace treaty. Wherein, Nader, confident in his position of strength, continued to demand recognition of Jafari Islam, as well as for the Ottomans to cede parts of Mesopotamia to him, notably the city of Baghdad, that historically had exchanged hands between the Ottomans and Iranians numerous times through the 16th and 17th centuries. With the Ottomans on the surface paying lip service, indulging Nader's demands, not dismissing anything outright, while in the background, began raising another army in case Nader decided to again resort to conflict. And so, with a firm ceasefire in place, peace negotiations proceeding, and the western and northwestern portions of his empire relatively quiet, Nader, for the time being, was apparently satisfied enough to leave the area while actively plotting on how to garner more funds and recruits in order to maintain his military footing. Plus, there remained the aforementioned internal rebellions in the southeastern quadrant of his empire and in Central Asia that were still active and that needed to be dealt with. But, as if we hadn't already received numerous indications that things were careening towards a dark place, this is the point that neither story really gets depressing. And I must admit that even while researching and writing the sequence that will now follow, it was hard not to get caught up in the full, bleak gravity of what would happen here on in. As Nather, after leaving some rather large garrisons in place, took with him some 60 to 70,000 troops that he led to the former Iranian capital of Isfahan, arriving there in late December 1745 remaining there for just over a month, where he initiated yet another round of wealth pilfering from his people, emptying their pockets to finance his unsustainable mission. Initially, focusing on the more affluent, commanding lists to be drawn up of those possessing the most wealth, who were then mercilessly targeted, often charged with having committed grievous offenses to the crown, then executed and all their riches taken. And when done there, systematically moving on to other sources, thoroughly plundering from the merchant class, and even recklessly taking from those barely scratching out a living as it was, issuing a decree that goat herds, however meager, would now be taxed, leaving a large proportion of his troops in Isfahan to enforce his oppressive commands and decrees before traveling to Mashhad and then Tehran through the balance of 1746. Showing a little more restraint, but doing similar things wherever he traveled, all in the effort to fill the royal coffers, that as quickly as it was coming in, was promptly spent, paid out to his troops to keep them loyal and thus neither in power. And as a quick aside, it was during this period when the peace treaty with the Ottomans was concluded, 
wherein Nather finally relented, giving up his demands regarding recognition of Jafari Islam as the fifth pillar of Islam, as well as any claims to Ottoman territories, given that the Ottomans remain staunchly defiant on those two points, ready to resort to a reopening of hostilities if need be. As a result, Nather's second war with the Ottomans, although he had clearly won the most important battles, in the end, yielding absolutely nothing for his nation, other than abject misery and loss of life, largely by his own hand. But as stated, Nather had by no means given up, as he went about in 1746, personally siphoning off the wealth of his subjects. Although no city within his realms would be subject to atrocities as badly as Isfahan, that Nather landed back at a year later in December 1746. This once fabulous city, that was already in a terrible state given Nather's last stay there a year prior, but that evolved into a nightmare for its inhabitants when he returned, his mind now completely unhinged. Witnessed firsthand by his newly installed royal physician, Louis Bazin, who left us a dark account of the situation, describing Isfahan as resembling a city which, having been taken by assault, had been given up to the fury of a conquering army and whenever he emerged from the palace grounds, he would see the corpses of men strewn about who had been strangled at Nather's orders or murdered by the soldiery, including other instances of unfortunate men seized, and each one, without even the semblance of a trial, suffered the loss of an eye, then cast into chains and into a fire. All witnesses of these executions, including those who carried them out, aghast. The city's inhabitants only spared from these ongoing terrible scourges once Nather departed with his army in late January 1747 for the province and city of Karman, some 650 kilometers to the southeast of Isfahan, that had been in rebellion for some time. And although relatively minor and quite disorganized compared to those that Nader his son Nazrola and his nephew Ali Kohli had dealt with in 1744, one that the Iranian monarch nonetheless squashed with extreme cruelty, entering the city with ease and restoring order, but then remaining there until March, all the while repeatedly subjecting those in Karman and its surrounding areas to numerous tragic instances of torture and death up to 40 to 50 victims every single day, even if he only suspected them of being involved in the revolt. One of the more grisly indicators of his time there being heaps of skulls left behind wherever his path took him. And while practically all of his top military officers had been on edge for some time now, after what they had witnessed at Isfahan and now at Kerman, it was becoming universally clear that Nader had taken leave of his senses, a sentiment that was about to ring louder given his next actions. Nader, in late March, then deciding to lead his army over 900 kilometers northeast, back to the city of Mashhad, the capital of his suffering empire. However, in doing so, not opting for the expected, longer but far safer route, instead, to the bewilderment of all under his command, and for some unknown sense of urgency driving their king, Nather decided to march his army right through the desert in southeastern Iran, called dasht -e lut translated from Persian as the emptiness plain. And doing so, without making adequate preparations for the crossing, resulting in a ruinous march, wherein it's estimated that a couple thousand of his men perished of hunger and thirst, falling to the ground to be swallowed up by the shifting sands. Leaving his army demoralized and exhausted, finally limping their way to Mashhad in late April 1747, whereupon Nather immediately commenced with leveling atrocities on the populace there, but with his addled mind also causing him to increasingly lash out at his own officers and troops, 
an intense paranoia heightening his erratic behavior, targeting anyone that came to mind. Granted, Nather wasn't entirely wrong, at least in this line of thinking, because given the fear and dysfunction he had sown amongst all those around him, including his son, nephew, royal advisors, the generals and officers of his army, not only was his army beginning to rapidly unravel and evaporate, with a notable number of large-scale desertions happening at this time, of those that remained, hidden internal alliances were being forged, hatching conspiracies and schemes to have Nather eliminated. Now, I can't emphasize enough how messy and convoluted of a situation that this must have been unfolding to become. Of course, made infinitely more complicated by the unending occurrence of revolts, in progress or at the edge of breaking out in practically every part of his empire, including one that had sparked up in the province of Sistan in southeastern Iran, that Nather commanded his nephew, Ali Kohli, and his favored, long-time general, Tamas Khan Jalayar, to take 40,000 troops and subdue. But then, a couple of weeks after they had left, suddenly calling into question their loyalty, demanding massive monetary payments as a show of their fealty, an action that drove Ali Kohli to revolt in earnest, joining his army with that of the rebels in Sistan. And as for Thomas Kanjaleer's fate, well, despite Nather's public questioning of his loyalties, which he was certainly aware of, his longtime general proved himself faithful to the last, attempting to discourage Ali Kohli from his course of action, who ended up poisoning him in response. With Ali Kohli then using the troops under his command to occupy the city of Herat in modern northwestern Afghanistan, where he began waging war against Nader, finding it not at all difficult to convince others to join his cause, fed up with the dangerous behavior of their Shah, finding a number of allies around Mashhad that were all too willing to bring him down. The walls rapidly closing in on Nader, thus adding to the pandemonium happening within his mind. One of the closest threats, coming from a tribal group of ethnic Kurds from a region called Kabushan, 140 kilometers northwest of Mashhad, that signaled the opening of their involvement in Ali Kohli's rebellion by raiding the royal stables just outside of the capital. An affront right on Nader's doorstep that he decided to deal with himself. In mid-June 1747, marching out from his capital at the head of 16,000 troops, a force including 4,000 Afghans and 12,000 Iranians. However, mere days into their march, while en route to engage the Kurds, stopping to set up their encampment for the evening on June 19th, which is when all the swirling intrigues of plots against him, both real and imagined, led Nather to become convinced that an impending doom was awaiting him in this spot, which he decided to take preemptive measures to head off, summoning the leaders of the Afghan portion of his army to gather before him and ordering them at a predestined time in the early morning of the next day to arrest the bulk of his Iranian officers, specifically ordering them to spare no use of force if any resistance was encountered, but also advising them to go about their regular business as if nothing was amiss, in order to not tip off the Iranian commanders as to what awaited them, thereby sealing Nader's fate since there were spies all about the camp, keeping close watchful eyes and ears on their unstable Shah, resulting in these orders being immediately leaked back to the targeted Iranian officers, who with their backs against the wall, were pushed over the edge to rapidly respond, launching their hasty plan late into the night, prior to the appointed time that the Afghans would initiate their arrests. While Nader slept in his tent, with a concubine beside him, the targeted Iranian officers, accompanied by a handful of troops that they implicitly trusted, a group in all numbering around 15, they approached the royal tent, 
as if to bring urgent news to the Shah, and began speaking in hushed tones with the three or four guards stationed outside, before quickly launching into action, overwhelming the guards by the way of strangulation in the aim to be as quiet as possible. The struggle outside the tent, however, waking the concubine, who roused neither from his slumber, and though 58 years of age, was still a soldier through and through, who scrambled from the bed to grasp the sword lying by his side, only to be met by three figures approaching with swords drawn in the dimly lit tent, that neither began shouting obscenities out at with venomous rage, but that he was unable to defend against, when, after a brief encounter, one of the three assassins managed to sever off the Shah's sword hand, before being cut down by the other two and decapitated, thus ending the life of Nader Shah, the second Alexander, the Napoleon of Persia, and the last of the great Asiatic military conquerors. In the immediate aftermath of the assassination, Nader's camp disintegrating, cascading into a sudden explosion of violence and chaos as the various factions, but primarily the Iranian and Afghan units, began fighting amongst themselves. And in the days that followed, as the news of what had transpired and Nader's death began spreading like wildfire, from the camp to Mashhad, the wider region of Khorasan and beyond, the uncertainty of the situation caused the various units of Nader's army, composed of people from different ethnic groups and parts of Iran, to make quick decisions as to where they would place their allegiance next. Not all, but many such groups simply grabbing whatever plunder they could get their hands on and returning back to their homelands, glad to be done with everything. You see, Nader had been the sovereign glue, that had kept all of these troops from different ethnic backgrounds together. And with him out of the picture, the rivalries and loyalties that had pre-existed Nader's arrival almost instantly resurfaced. And while a small corps of Iranian soldiers remained that considered Nader's son, Nazrullah, to be the rightful heir, only a few in the low thousands ended up throwing their support behind him because another self-proclaimed successor to Nader's throne emerged, his nephew, Ali Koli Khan. And although his claim may have been weaker, due to already being in conflict with Nader, he had since managed to organize a formidable collection of allies under him, thereby squarely placing him in the strongest position in terms of military might. Upon learning of Nader's demise, right away, proclaiming himself as the new Shah of Iran, and taking on a new name, Adel Shah, meaning the just king, before venturing out from Herat in July 1747, making his move to solidify the crown. Through a brief civil war fought over the next months, that saw Adel Shah subsequently lead his forces into Mashhad and throughout Khorasan to defeat the much smaller force that had rallied to Nasrullah's side, who Adel Shah then captured and executed, thereby eliminating his biggest rival. In the process, however, also massacring almost all of Nader's relatives, his sons, and their offspring, sparing only one of Nader's grandchildren from this fate, a 13-year-old boy by the name of Sharuk wanting to keep a male descendant of Nader's lineage alive as a potential game piece, which he indeed later became. Though a fascinating side note here that was just too good not to include is that one of Nader's sons actually managed to survive the entire ordeal. His fourth and youngest son, Mustafa Ali Mirza, who was 11 years old at the time and brought by loyalists for safekeeping at the court of Maria Theresa in Vienna, the Holy Roman Empress and ruler of the Habsburg Empire, where he would be renamed Joseph von Semlin, convert to Christianity, and later serve admirably as a talented commander first in the Austrian and then Russian armed forces, fondly referred to as the Prince of Persia among his troops. After an impressive military career, 
retiring at the age of 56, but then later in life, catching the attention of Napoleon, who offered military support to von Semlin if interested in making an attempt to recover his father's throne. An offer that von Semlin rejected, reportedly saying, Neither me nor my children think about the peacock throne. Even if I had any rights to become king of Iran, I cede them to Francis II, Holy Roman Emperor, who supported me to this age. But let's now return to the main sequence of events. Because after this scourge of Nader's sons and grandsons, Adil Shah was indeed the one who would become Nader's successor. However, his reign would be a short one, lasting just over one year. Defeated in battle and replaced by his brother Ibrahim in July 1748, whose tenure as Shah would be even shorter, lasting only two months, killed by various factions of the Persian nobility, that in October 1748 then installed Nader's grandson, Shah Rukh, to the Iranian throne. But being so young at 14, Shah Rukh only served as a figurehead a puppet to various strongmen controlling the strings. And while Shahrukh Shah, the last of the Afshari dynasty, would officially retain his title until 1796, by that point, Nader's enormous empire had been whittled down to a mere fraction of its former grandeur, consisting of a small proportion of lands around Mashhad. With the reality of the situation being that Nader's empire like his army, had quickly disintegrated in less than 10 years after his death, including all of his foreign conquests rolled back. Right after Nader's assassination, the Khanats of Bukhara and Kiva in Central Asia declaring independence, along with Oman and the bulk of the possessions in the Persian Gulf that had only tenuously been a part of the Iranian Empire immediately being lost. In the east, what Nader had conquered at the expense of the Afghans and Mughals, all of this eventually coming under the control of Ahmad Durrani, who had been one of Nader's top Afghan commanders, thereby establishing the Durrani Empire, which is often regarded as the foundation for the modern state of Afghanistan. And in the northwest, the Caucasus, the Lesgines emerging out of their mountain strongholds to reclaim their wider homeland in Dagestan and Azerbaijan, with eastern Georgia also declaring independence. However, the splintering of Nader's empire also happening within the lands associated with modern Iran. During the aforementioned struggles between the various figures fighting for his crown, almost all provincial governors declaring independence establishing states of their own, and then fighting amongst each other, resulting in an era wherein what had been the Afsharid Iranian Empire, pretty much all of it succumbing to what was essentially a state of anarchy that Nader laid the groundwork for during his reign. And to better help illustrate what this looked like, I'll include a couple of maps on my website, to show how Iran had shattered into so many fragments following Nader's demise. Which brings to mind the question, how did everything Nader had built, how and why did it unravel so quickly? The answer for this is something we'll consider alongside his longer-term legacy. Because, as you have most probably gathered by now, given what we know of Nader's lifetime, while his military prowess more accurately described as tactical brilliance, is essentially beyond dispute in having played a pivotal role in preventing the complete collapse of Iran during his early career. In the same breath, as he grew in stature, steadily gaining respect, wealth, adoration and titles, which eventually placed him in the position to usurp the Iranian crown, this ultimately bestowed Nader with the ability to pursue his incessant push for warfare without restraint, the cornerstone of which was the expansion of his intensely disciplined, trained, and modernized army. This pursuit taking precedence over everything else, even to the extent of sacrificing the well-being and beliefs of his people, which of course 
incited rebellions to his rule from the many disaffected groups within his realms. And Nather, in response, asserting his authority through increasingly oppressive force. A vicious cycle, which certainly helps to explain how Iran fell apart into so many pieces after his lifetime. Granted, there's a deeper, more personal aspect to this line of reasoning, with an important consideration being his meager starting point as an irrelevant youth, and neither simply being carved out of the violent world from which he was born into. And because of this, part of me suspects that, at the foundation of Nather's being, may have been a person desperately trying to gain some measure of control in his chaotic environment, struggling to restore order to the world around him, doing so over the course of a truly fascinating career, starting from his days as a young musketman in Khorasan, to that of a warlord, general of the Iranian army, regent, Shah, and finally, Shahanshah, a king of kings, firmly holding the Afsharid Iranian Empire in his hands. But then, particularly towards the latter part of his reign, clutching onto it so tightly that it would be inadvertently crushed into dust, bringing us to one of the final aspects of Nader's lifetime that undoubtedly impacted his ability to make sound decisions thus complicating his legacy, one that was beyond his control. The physical, but especially the mental health ailments that surfaced for him from 1738 onwards. And although I'm convinced that we can't blame this for everything, as Nather, prior to the onset of his health issues, had already shown a penchant for ruthlessly despoiling his subjects to fuel his military endeavors, while indifferent to the harm he was causing, it seems rather apparent that his deteriorating state of mind inflamed his already brutal and harsh ways, making him exceedingly cruel in the last four years of his reign. And given all of this, it probably comes as no surprise to you that Nader is considered a controversial figure in Iranian history, regarded as a hero by some, a villain to others. A sentiment that goes all the way back in history to the point of his death. Since following his assassination in 1747, his body was sent to Mashhad and buried, where he remained for nearly 200 years in a reportedly austere and uncommemorated tomb. Until the 1960s, when an elaborate site called the Nadiri Garden Complex was built in Mashhad as his final resting place. Featuring elaborate statues, Nader's tomb is the main central draw, and two museums on the complex grounds, one relating to different periods of Iranian history and one focused on Nader Shah's era. In tribute to this exceptionally talented military tactician and battlefield commander, who formed his Afsharid Iranian empire into a devastating militaristic state, but at the same time, was the source of so much suffering among his people, making for a complicated lifetime and legacy, best summed up and encapsulated by the words of Louis Bazin, Nader's royal physician, who wrote the following of Nader after his death. He did not have a permanent home. His military camp was his court, his palace was his tent, and his closest confidants were his bravest soldiers. Undaunted in battle, he brought courage and was always in the thick of danger among his brave men, as long as the battle lasted. He did not neglect any of the measures dictated by foresight. Nevertheless, the repulsive greed and unprecedented cruelties that wore his subjects ultimately led to his fall, and the extreme horrors that were caused by him made Persia cry. He was adored feared, and cursed at the same time. With our series on Nader Shah now completed, as much as I have enjoyed delving into his fascinating story, I'm extremely excited to be moving on to the next series, and another prolific warlord of history, 
one often regarded as one of the best military commanders and strategists of all time, whose story will bring us back to antiquity to explore the world of the Roman Republic in the late 3rd century BCE, a period wherein Rome was facing one of the greatest threats to its existence it would ever endure pushed dangerously close to the breaking point by its arch-rival Carthage during the Second Punic War. And while the Carthaginian general Hannibal generally gets most of the historical focus due to his magnificent campaign tearing up the Italian peninsula, defeating everything the Romans were throwing at him, the next series will be featured not on him, but on the man who would come to stop him saving Rome and setting the stage for it to vault into the leading position as the dominant force of the ancient world. Publius Cornelius Scipio, more commonly known as Scipio Africanus. A figure and name that is widely known, yes, but receives far less attention comparatively to Hannibal, and that typically, when given, is primarily focused upon his famous victory at the Battle of Zama that brought Carthage to its knees. But understanding that there is a great deal more to his impressive lifetime and career, making for a series wherein we'll explore Scipio's youth and early involvement in the Second Punic War, narrowly surviving through some of Rome's most disastrous military setbacks, before expertly navigating the politics of his nation, possessing the wisdom and savviness that someone far beyond his age would have typically had to secure a command and army that he would lead to take the fight to Carthage, campaigning in Hispania, proving him a spectacular general and battlefield commander, along with an uncanny ability to procure important allies and drum up key support in the most unlikeliest of places. Later, showing tremendous dedication and strength of character despite not supported by the Roman Senate to, by himself, assemble and lead the army that would audaciously invade the Carthaginian homeland. In the lead up to his incredible victory over Hannibal on the plains of Zama in North Africa, followed by what Scipio did after the Second Punic War, involving himself in the Roman Seleucid War, further galvanizing Rome's status as an unrivaled power in the Mediterranean. However, all Scipio's successes throughout his career making him a threat internally, repeatedly sucked into the vortex of bitter Roman politics that would eventually spit him out maligned, despite everything he had done for his nation. This and more to come in the next episode of the Warlords of History podcast. If you want to support the podcast, there are many ways you can do so. You can tell your family and friends about the show. Please rate, review, and subscribe on whichever platform you happen to access the show on. You can follow the podcast on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And lastly, you can head on over to the show's website, warlordsofhistory.com, where I'll include some additional info, like images and maps, pertaining to this episode for your viewing pleasure. And where... You can also reach out to me with any thoughts, questions, or suggestions. I would love to hear from you. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the episode. Theme music from Audionautics.com